and welcome. Uh, I'm your host, Joan Dong of the SA Toronto Hub. I'm speaking from Toronto, uh, the land of the traditional territory of, and still home to many diverse Indigenous nations in Canada. I want to acknowledge the privilege to live and work in this beautiful land and the responsibilities to respect the land. Um, it is my great pleasure to be co-hosting today's session with Karen Schumann Dupre of Innovation North. We will explore the intersection of uh, business, innovation, systems, and sustainability with Dr. Tima Bansal. The session will start with Karen introducing herself and Tima, and then the three of us will carry a conversation. Uh, we will open the floor for audience questions in the end for about 10, 15 minutes. So please um, introduce yourself in the chat and uh, set your questions in the chat, but label the questions as Q uh, or question so that we won't miss it. Karen, welcome. Thanks so much, Joanne. Uh, hi, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and a part of the SI Toronto and London Hub community. I'm really excited to be introducing uh, the founder and leader of Innovation North and my boss, uh, Tima Bonsal. I'll uh, give you a little bit of background about Tima. She has been a professor at Ivy for over 20 years, and she has been studying and researching business sustainability and innovation for over 30 years. Uh, her pioneering work on these subjects has left uh, an, an unending imprint and in the Ivy community that everything that is connected to sustainability and business um, has been founded by her and led by her. Um, and so that would be the Center for Business, uh, for Building Sustainable Value, pardon me, and the Network for Business Sustainability, two unique environments that actually address this question of in the intersection of business and sustainability. Additionally to that, she's also the Canadian Research Chair in Business Sustainability, the Vice Chair of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Education, as an example. If I let, read off her entire CV, we would need way more time. Uh, so I encourage you to follow her writing at Forbes.com. Um, I think it's also important to note that she is one of our top 2% of cited researchers and scholars in business and management globally. But most importantly, I think, and what we want to share today is that Tima is an optimist and that she believes that business can be a force for good. And she believes in meeting people where they are and inviting them in to be part of the research. And I think that's a really exciting piece of her work. So uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Thanks, Karen, for Thank such you. a generous introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Karen and Tima. Welcome. So you. Um, you have such a, an expensive experience. And thank you for joining us and share some of it uh, with uh, the SI community. Uh, let's dive in. So you've been researching business and sustainability for over three decades. But lately you've shifted your attention through a different lens, systems innovation in the context of business. Can you share with us uh, what you mean by systems innovation from a business perspective and how does it differ from the conventional notion of a systems innovation, which is from a social perspective typically? And uh, is it just a different uh, framing uh, as a business innovation from a complex systems perspective? Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. That's a great question. Uh, you asked the specific question about how systems innovation differs from business systems innovation. And I'll answer that question. But then you also led with this connection between sustainability and systems. And maybe we can revisit that question at some other point. Um, but how is systems innovation, much of the work that you all do that's, uh, that's joined the call here, differ from a business perspective of systems innovation? The biggest difference is that business really is, um, directs its own, its focus to itself and towards profitability, which isn't a systems lens. And systems innovators generally tend to take a systems lens. So they say, what's good for the system? Now, if businesses only look at what's good for themselves and they all act in their self-interests, then inevitably we will end up with some of the systems issues at scale that we have now. So why do we need business 
do, why do we need innovation? Um, why do companies need innovation from a systems lens? Is that it will prevent some of these unintended consequences for what business has been doing. Does that answer your question, Joanne? Sorry. Uh, yes, I'm glad you mentioned um, unintended uh, consequences because that's a, such a, a term that's often used uh, almost as a justification when we make mistakes. So um, before we dive that deep into uh, the conversation, um, I'm interested or curious to know what uh, led you to uh, shedding your flashlight into the system in innovation angle. So why at this point, systems innovation versus business innovation from a complex systems perspective, you know, this is systems innovation from a, a business perspective. Yeah, it's really that. interesting. That's uh, a great question too, that there's been two, uh, two approaches to innovation. There's been the corporate approach and there's been the NGO approach. Given the community that we're speaking to right now, I'll start with the NGO approach. So NGOs have often thought about systems innovation or systemic innovation. And so they think about dealing with big systems issues. So some systems issues could be, let's say sanitation in India, or it could be poverty in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, now these are systems problems that NGOs will often try to tackle. And we have a protocol in which to do it. And because NGOs look at the system, they have some approaches that make sense. That would be the systemic innovation view that's often used. The other approach to innovation is from the business angle. Now, if businesses are self-interested and they try to innovate so that they end up in a better spot, which means more money, then there's different approaches that they take. The two most common approaches is a stage gate model. A stage gate model says that you start with an idea and you say, let's go through a number of gates and each gate scrutinizes the idea more and more and then ultimately says, yes, we should move forward. So uh, artificial, or no, let's say 3D printing. 3D printing is actually a really great idea. It doesn't make sense for us in our business. Well, let's interrogate it and see, do we have a large enough market? Do we have uh, the right technology? Can we get the supply chain? Does it, does it meet all the legal requirements? You can see the gates that companies would go through. Ultimately, they say, yes, there's enough money that we can make they were to go forward. That's the stage gate model. The problem with the stage gate model is that it means that the environment or the system becomes a minimum hurdle. They just have to meet the laws. And so ultimately they could make money from 3D printing, but end up creating uh, unintended consequences, like I said earlier. So arguably the plastics waste is no single company that's made a mistake. It's a bunch of companies that all sort of aggregate to a level that has created the plastics crisis. That's the stage gate model. Another approach is design thinking that corporations often use. What does design thinking look like? You have a challenge. You say, uh, companies are uh, buying my product or my glue fails at 50, 000, or 30,000 feet. Uh, and so you have a, a specific problem and then becomes a design challenge. And so then you go through various sets of exercises to make it, to find a solution to the challenge. Those sorts of exercises include, go talk to users or build some empathy around it. Um, ideate around solutions. So get lots of people in the room and think about brainstorming, prototype, test, and then launch. So what's the problem with that? Once again, the problem or the solution at the end of it is a solution to the problem. That becomes the issue is that you solve a problem that is not necessarily good for the system, but is good for the firm. And so what we need is to combine stage gate models, starts with ideas, design thinking, which starts with problems, and a systems perspective that says, let's not just make money for the firm, let's do something better for the system at the same time. So I think that there's two approaches, the NGO approach, systems problems, the corporate approach, corporate problems, there's nothing in between. 
that's a gap that needs to be filled. That's a gap that Innovation North is trying to fill. Wow, that's, um, I, I'm so glad you brought up uh, uh, systems issues versus, you know, oh, it's just sustainability issues. Uh, because the gap between NGOs approach versus uh, corporate approach. Um, but then, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how we frame a problem. So the reason I'm so happy to hear a business leader and scholar uh, such as you uh, raising uh, this, this issue and shedding the flashlight on the very problems that is systemic. Um, so how we frame a problem often determines uh, the options for solutions and often uh, the directions and scope uh, for treatment. So I remember this is, this is a point raised by uh, the uh, two uh, scientists who coined uh, the term wicked problems, Rito and Weber in 1973 in their essay. And they were addressing urban planning uh, and public policy making issues. But you know, how do you see that um, apply uh, in the business world, because you clearly are tackling business problems, not labeling them as a sustainability problem, but labeling, well, maybe labeling isn't the right word, but labeling them as uh, uh, system issues. So I'm really just, just happy uh, to see that. Can you, can you share just a, a little bit more about this uh, knowledge gap? Um, between uh, the classic NGO, which is perhaps a social uh, innovation approach versus uh, the corporate approach, how the corporate approach might be uh, different. Thank you. So a, um, the, uh, uh, you talked about urban planning is something that uh, Riddle and Weber would have talked about in terms of a wicked problem. Why is it wicked? It's because it's, there's multiple relationships. And you can't really figure out the source of the problem. And so therefore, there's no single source. There's multiple relationships and then not multiple points of intervention. But when a company has an issue, let's say a company is trying to um, uh, install 5G, internet 5G, okay? Then what are they trying to figure out? Well, how many households can we serve in the, the 5G issue? Uh, how can we get a good quality of service? How can it be reliable? All they're trying to think about is offering 5G. But what if 5G ends up creating all sorts of other problems that are associated with it? It's not even on their radar because if they're only thinking about servicing a household, it becomes a bilateral relationship with a household not a relationship that you can think about everything else. So arguably the, you know, Facebook has done a tremendous job at what it's intended to do. And yet at the same time has created these implications on society and it is rewarded for creating social addictions, uh, well, addictions to social media. So if it's rewarded to doing that, then it wants more eyeballs. If it wants more eyeballs and that addiction, then it ends up with, teenage girls that have issues that result from social media, from Facebook, but that's not Facebook's problem. So I'm feeling like I might be uh, going in circles here, but what we need to do is to get corporations then to say, um, not that addiction issues for teenage girls are our problem, but if they see themselves as trying to fix systems problems and not create more problems, as well as making money, they can find solutions that are actually good for themselves and good for the world simultaneously. That's the sweet spot. That's the place that we can play. And so that means finding a different approach to innovation, one that's baked into what corporations do so that they have a methodology, a toolkit, a toolkit like StageGate or like design thinking that they just systematically apply because organizations love routines and love systematic processes. But if we can bake that into the innovation process, then every innovation that they create, they have a lens on, am I making the world better? Or am I potentially even hurting the world? And that becomes part of the calculus and what they do. 
And so that is our aim is to build the toolkit so that uh, the system's perspective is baked right into what they do. Yeah. Have I, have I made that clear? And so the 5G example for um, is that uh, a telecommunications company would then say things like, okay, we're putting in 5G. I've sold 5G to uh, households or I've installed it into the internet of things, but let's see what the wider implications are on society. If I build 5G with, let's say, data security already baked in, I will now have a, um, an, uh, a market that I wouldn't normally have. And this market is enduring. It's not going to be a market that turns on me as people are now turning on Facebook. And so I think that this orientation towards the systems perspective is possible. It just requires corporations to extend the lens of field of view to the system and not just themselves. Well, thank you for sharing that. So building a, a set of tools for people to leverage um, to towards uh, systemic approaches in solving or tackling uh, the tough, wicked problems we face. Um, uh, it's just my mind all of a sudden going to, uh, so you talk about a knowledge gap, but uh, are you going to, or have you ever thought to research uh, action gaps? Um, because uh, research in psychology and uh, behavioral economics has shown that our societies has become more and more abstract so that means um, the distance between our actions and the consequences are becoming larger and larger and further and further away. That means we become more blind to the consequences of our actions, going back to your early point on um, unintended consequences. And we, so how much do you think, um, you know, knowing, hey, here is a toolkit, and we've, you touched on design thinking. We've seen how design thinking at one point was dabbed as the tool set to be creative, to innovate, to solve business problems, and fueled by Google's design sprint methodology. It went through and still sweeping through the corporate world. It became so popular. Um, so, and then uh, in the meantime, um, how are we filling in uh, this, this action gap, meaning uh, our understanding of our actions and their uh, consequences because we simply uh, don't see them? Uh, so I think that the question that you're asking um, is how do we, if we have a toolkit, how do we actually get organizations to apply the toolkit and act on the toolkit? Is that right? Yes, that and also how much of uh, the unintended consequences are the result of our ignorance, truly unintended, or how much is it uh, the underlying incentive structures that create the conditions for all of us to become ignorant? I mean, again, research has shown that the way human beings, all of us, every single one of us, is capable of doing bad things. And we often think, that in, you know, if a system gone bad, it's because there are a few bad leaders, bad people. If we remove the bad people and then the systems will be fixed. Yeah. Um, but you know, really that's not the case. The case is the underlying structures that businesses are pretty in that creates the condition. You know, we can all become or capable of becoming bad under the right circumstances. So how much of the unintended consequences are really unintended or ignorant, or uh, it's due to uh, the underlying structures that makes us so? Yeah, I've heard that express as, uh, is it bad apples or a bad apple cart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Arguably, it's, uh, it's inevitably some of both, right? Um, but we are in, we are victims of the system in which we're embedded, but we also create the system in which we're embedded. And so whether it's the institutional uh, structures of laws or even the schools that I go to or what's been taught at the school or 
institutions like family and marriage, those are all soft institutions, right? They all shape what we do and they, they keep us in line, but they also blind us for what we don't see. So are, are people bad? Yeah, I'm sure that some people are bad, but I don't think that that's the issue. I think that the issue is bigger that, or is more so that we're in a system that has created some of the problems that we have. Well, what's in my view, now this is me in a business school, so I have a very specific objective or lens through which I look. What's the problem that I see is businesses are a lot have created a lot of the unintended consequences so they have also created a huge huge amount of wealth and so the reason why i live in such an amazing place and we're even on zoom is because of business so we can't you know we have we have definitely benefited from it but inevitably what's happened is that you know we we now have these huge climate issues we have huge public health issues and public health both in terms of social or sorry physical health but mental health issues we have income inequality that's growing it's escalating rather um, than actually the gap is shrinking we can go on about those systems issues what's created those issues well businesses have played a role but specifically what we teach in business schools, and I'm only I'm turning the spotlight back to, sorry, the blame back to myself. And so maybe the people around me is that we teach executives to reduce the problem to its simplest form. So we want to look at the root problem. And as soon as we try to find a single problem that businesses try to solve and simplify things, then we end up inevitably having solutions to problems that might be one, the wrong problem, but two, even if it's a right problem, when it aggregates to the systems level, we end up creating impacts that we didn't intend. So like I said, at one point, and we were fishing with a you know, fishing line, it was not a problem because we could only consume how much we were gonna eat. As soon as we start, using um, uh, um, trawlers and we start scraping the bottoms of oceans at a scale, at a scale, and that's really critical, at a scale that we cannot consume or over consume that the fish can't regenerate, then we end up with a systems problem. But if the business can only reduce a problem to what it expects to see, it will only think about the fish that it wastes because of lost income not the impact of the overfishing on the ocean. So the mistake that we've made in business schools is that we teach executives to reduce the problem to simplest form. What we need to do is to give executives a different toolkit, a different way of thinking. That has to start with us. And if we start to build businesses, start to teach executives how to think about systems problems and see systems and not just themselves we're going to be a good step forward in fixing a lot of these issues we might not be able to fix what we have right now maybe we've passed some tipping points uh and this is karen i'm going to speak to you me being the optimist but sometimes i'm not as optimistic when it comes to tipping points and i think that we have surpassed some okay so we get over those tipping points but we need something to give to executives and businesses for those who want to do a different way of operating, we need to give them those toolkits. That's our aim. I would argue that there's lots of businesses out there that want to see the system, want to create positive impact, want to create less harm, and they don't know how. So we start there. Well, uh, Karen, feel free to jump in if you need to. So tipping point, I, I, I love that concept. and. Uh, you know, that leads to leverage point made famous by Daniela Meadows uh, in her 1999 essay where she proposed 12, 12 uh, leverage points or intervention points that it's much talked about. Um, so how do we identify potential taking points so that we can actually turn them into leverage points and then intervene in uh, the systems to prevent unintended consequences from happening or reduce 
uh, the probabil uh, probabilities of unintended consequences from happening. Um, so the, the intervention points or leverage points are is an interesting conversation. And I think that most of us here in this room would, you know, uh, would, you know, Donella Meadows is in some ways our idol or our god, right? She has really shaped the field. But so I'm only going to speak for myself here, but I find the approach to intervention points or leverage points almost intractable. And uh, I think that this, uh, this idea of knowing a system, mapping a system is really difficult because if much of a system is invisible, then how can we map it? We can sort of map relationships among actors and things but ultimately it's really complex. And then you're supposed to identify leverage points or intervention points among them. And then they can go from, you know, uh, specific products to right down to changing mindsets. That's such a broad spectrum and it's intractable. And if it's intractable, we're never gonna get businesses that have to operate fast to act. So what we need to do is give them a different approach to acting, not just thinking, but to acting. And that means that we, one, put think and act closer together. And so it's not about mapping the space and then figuring out analytically, what is the intervention point? What if we said to businesses, understand enough of the space that you can then figure out what your next set of actions are. Identify those actions, move forward on those actions and then I learn more about the space and then move forward on those actions. So we don't look for the grand ambition that we're going to have a silver bullet that will solve the world's problems with an intervention point. What we do is a set of little actions. Let's go to the circular economy. The only way that we will ever deal with the circular economy. For those of you who don't know what the circular economy is, I'll tell you, but um, but the only way that we're going to deal with the circular economy is through a set of intermediate small steps forward. Can't change the whole system. We have to just be able to move forward. So what is the circular economy? If you think of the linear economy, you take everything from the earth, land, air, water, take everything from the earth, manufacture it, distribute it, consume it, put it back to the earth. Eventually that should come back in renewed form and it goes through it again. But the problem is if you have too much throughput in a linear economy, you end up one, extracting too much and two, wasting too much and you create too much pollution in the world. Circular economy says, let's not put stuff back into the earth. Let's just put it right back into the supply chain. And so when the, the waste that comes out of it, when a pro pro product, reaches its end of life, it goes right back into the supply chain, gets renewed. And so then it becomes an industrial process rather than a natural process of the earth. Okay, that's a circular economy. To do that, we're gonna to have to have different types of products. We're gonna to have to have different manufacturing. So we're gonna to have to design products differently. For example, you can't have plastics that have different types of plastics. You have to be able to separate the plastics and so that the plastics that can be recycled are actually separated from the ones that cannot be or from the other materials that cannot be. And so once we do that, that's a really big process. You have to design differently. You have to manufacture differently. You have to collect plastics at the end of it. Huge changes to supply chain and to product design. But we don't have to do it all at once. We just have to make one company figure out a way to collect the plastics, figure out a way to reuse them, make one relationship with another company in the supply chain, and we edge forward. So let's stop thinking about intervention points, okay, creating a new system, uh, carte blanche, everything changes at once. Let's think about those small steps along the way that we can each make. If we each make those steps, we will end up in a better world. That's how we can change corporate mindsets. It's a process of how we see the world and act in the world, putting the two together, seeing and acting closer together, 
at the same time, it moves us forward. And it's a, it's a different mindset than what Donella Meadows first talked about. I love it. Thank you so much. I love the small step approach. And, you know, I, I, I like reading, so I've read a long ago, Stuart Kaufman's Adjacent Possibilities. And, and you think, oh, yeah, it makes sense. But I think you just put it so simply. Yes, we have to start where we are um, and take small steps. So we can't just uh, expect a big ban. And then all of a sudden, viola. You know, we're sustainable, everything's good. I, I think that's not going to happen. So can you share? Thank you for, for that. It's very encouraging to, to hear uh, the small steps approach. I, I think it's always warming and, and hopeful and brings, at least to me, a lot of uh, more optimism into this whole uh, uh, global issues that we're facing. So in that now, can you share uh, with us some of the things that you're doing uh, to actually, uh, you know, demonstrate the small steps like the work you're doing at uh, Innovation North? Thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, Innovation North, let me just give you a little bit of background as to who we are, what we are. So uh, it's uh, an organization of the Ivy Business School at Western University in London, Canada, Yost, not to be confused with uh, London, England. This is little London, as we call it, a little community of 400,000 people with a good business school. Uh, we, there's a knowledge gap, as we said at the beginning, and that knowledge gap is between taking systems innovation from what NGOs have done it to corporate innovation, the way the corporations have done it and found a, find a place in the middle that creates money for the company, but also makes the world better. Okay. That's the knowledge gap. So we're a research collaborative. We started as a research community. And then we have invited 20 organizations to join us in this journey. And we're co-creating the knowledge for in this, in this space in between the, the two. So Innovation North has about 10 researchers and about 20 corporate executives or 20 companies with corporate executives and in innovation. Uh, the companies include companies, they're all Canada-based, but they're some of them are multinational, Cisco, Walmart, um, uh, all the local ones are coming to mind. We have largest oil and gas company, Suncor. We have one of the largest pension plans in Canada, Ontario Teachers. Karen, who am I missing? There's some of the big- We have IKEA, we have JLL, we have TrioVest, Mattamy Homes, uh, to name another few. Yeah, thanks, Karen, our partnerships and, and marketing director. Uh, our research team includes, and I am uh, really uh, appreciative of the people that are here, but I see Ju Young Lee, I see Elise, um, uh, and then, of course, Hannah Hill, who's on our team as well as in the group. And I'm sure there's others I don't see here. So we have our Innovation North team. We have our corporate team. We meet every quarter, every three months, and we discuss how we can build this new, we can fill this gap from a knowledge point of view. Then you asked Joanne, what about action? And so then we take, we want to create some use cases. And so we're actually applying some of these ideas in amongst the organizations that have joined us. And so uh, cooperators, one of our companies, is a, one of Canada's largest insurance companies is thinking about applying the framework in, in their work, the toolkit, sorry, I should say, the toolkit uh, in building an, uh, a new approach to insurance. We have Canada's largest, second largest stock exchange, NEO, that wants to build a new financial instrument that will deal with biodiversity. So we're going to actually create new products. Once again, they end up making money for the current firm cooperators and NEO will uh, have a larger market, but then they'll start to deal with the diversity problem, with some of the sustainability problems and in insurance in terms of rebuilds. So these are all good things. Thinking and action co-created with business and researchers. That's what we do at Innovation North. 
That's a so exciting uh, co-creation, and that's the hallmark of uh, systems innovation. Uh, Jaws has personally hosted many, many co-creation sessions, leveraging input from a diverse uh, uh, group of people from all over the world and all uh, walks of life. So uh, um, we look forward to collaborate with you totally uh, in terms of co-creation and creating new approaches. So. So in terms of new approaches so, or different uh, ways of innovating compared to uh, the conventional wisdom in the business world, which is very much based on uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor's uh, The Principles of Scientific Management from a century ago, was it 1911? And during the last 10, 15 years, through our effort to digitalize everything that we do in the corporate world and in government as well, Taylorism has been revived instead of disappearing uh, as the fourth wave of Taylorism. So how can we really change corporate's mindsets instead of, you know, people's mindset that Peter Sange, you know, Raz Akoff, many others, uh, Daniela Meadows, Margaret Whitley, Margaret Mead, you just name all the system thinkers known, they've all addressed, and Daniela Meadows mentioned, you know, the toughest uh, leverage point, it's really changing the last two paradigm shift and changing people's mind. So how are we going to turn around in, in this, digital age and day where Taylorism, it's not going away. You know, we're talking about scientific approach to solve wicked problems. And Wito and Weber challenged that notion, you know, 50, 60, 50 years ago in 1973, saying that the scientific approach has failed to address social and urban planning related, policy making related issues. And that's when they coined uh, the term wicked problems. So now, you know, Taylorism, it's very much ingrained in the corporate world and in government as well. So how are we like, what, what do you see, not just in the knowledge gap, but in the action gap to turn around this Hercules um, belief uh, embedded in all uh, uh, businesses and governments and, and social uh, societies as well. I'm going to go back to a point that I made earlier that I think that the reason why uh, Taylorism scientific um, management has taken, sorry, has persisted is because of the way that we teach in business schools. And so we are part of the problem for sure. Um, and let me just give you some examples, but what do we teach in business schools and operations? It's you know, we, we have supply chains and we're looking for efficiency within supply chains. We're looking for efficiency in production and that is scientific management. And so then we become just labor becomes in some ways capital, right? We're just the machine in the, in, in the organization. The other things that we do in marketing, we t show, tell people how to sell more stuff. We don't think about the system in, um, in finance, we're trying to raise capital for a business. We don't care about where that capital is raised or for what, or we're looking at to IPO organizations. In uh, strategy, um, we're looking to, you know, how to maximize profits through competition. In every single course that we teach, we reduce the problem so that each course aims to achieve its objective. So like I said, operations is about efficiency, marketing is about selling, strategy is about growth of the firm and competition. That all, it's inevitable that sci, um, scientific management has persisted, but there's something else that's afoot. And I think that this is really key, is that corporations are seeing the system more than they've ever seen it before. And exactly what happened in COVID has required, has shown us, has illuminated the interconnections among people, the interconnections of financial markets, the interconnections in supply chains, by the way, financial markets. We are seeing all markets around the world responding exactly the same way to the financial crises, 
And this has only been in the last two decades or so that we've seen such interconnection among financial markets. Supply chains, we see products and they're just disrupted around the world now because of COVID. Of course, uh, we see people getting sick everywhere because people are moving around. I think that businesses recognize that they can't operate in the way that they've done before. They just don't know how to do it differently. So our issue is not executives being saying, I want to do Taylorism. I want, this is the only way to do things. There's of course many like that, but there are an increasing number. They're saying, how do we deal with the complexity of systems? Cause I have to be more adaptable. I have to be more resilient. I have to um, be more agile. All of those concepts are systems concepts, but they require a different way of thinking. We have scientific management science which is very much about deductive logic, hypotheses and testing, and it's incrementalized, it's reduced things. There's a different type of logic. Arguably, and this is gonna be really provocative, but big data has a different logic. Big data requires us to look at patterns. It requires us to recognize trends as opposed to scientific theses that we try to test. So inductive, deep insights, ethnographic insights are being valued more than ever before. And big data insights are being valued more than ever before. And I think that there is an appetite, a hunger by corporate executives to do things differently. We in business schools don't know how. It's our responsibility then to change curriculum to change, uh, to research new ways of doing, to find use cases of companies that are doing it right. And there are many. We just have, we have to change the machine. As you said, you have to change the paradigm and the mindset. So Tima, I think this is a great opportunity to actually address the question of how are you able to do this in a practical sense at Ivy? You know, how are you able to initiate you know, the BSV and the NBS environments and those communities and that work and that research. And how were you able to kind of show the impact and the import of this work within a traditional environment and create the path and the opportunity for Innovation North to come to be years later as well? That's a really great question, Karen. Uh, so I talked about um, systems, that systems, if we're gonna change systems, we shouldn't be looking for intervention points um, or silver bullets, we have to look at many nudges along the way. And so from my own experience, how do I create change within a business school that's very traditional? And those of you who know the Ivy Business School in Canada, it's, um, it is one of the hallmark traditions that used, you know, it was Harvard of the North at one point, since then lost that, but you can sort of sense this traditional perspective that it holds. So if you're going to change a business school in which the paradigm is so deeply entrenched around profits, in fact, I got to tell you a story. Uh, I met an alumni who, you know, is of about the same vintage as I. And so he was at school 25 years ago. And he says, she is a she. She says that in class, at the beginning of class, one of her professors used to make them chant. The purpose of business is profits. The purpose of business is profits. The purpose of, can you imagine? No wonder, no wonder we're in the mess that we get. They used to have, you know, people used to smoke in the back seats of classes or back, back room chairs in the back of the class. Uh, okay, so how do I create change in the business school that's so entrenched? It has to be a series of nudges. And so one, you appeal to a few people of some influence in the business school saying, here's a new way of thinking. We need to think about, and, and you use you know, the hooks or the tropes or whatever it might be that they can buy into. And they say, okay, we'll give you five classes to teach sustainability. This is back then. And I say, great. And I do that, I teach them. And the students want to throw me out because they say, this has nothing to do with business. And so my ratings are low, teaching ratings are low. And, and yet I still persist. And then I managed to hire one of my colleagues 
who's a sustainability person. And I start to create my own narrative. Storytelling becomes part of this. And all of a sudden, some students feel like they're not having a voice and they start to gain more voice. And you get more colleagues and more students and then the world starts to change and we have climate events or sorry, weather events or climate related. All of these means that the whole system is starting to say that we need something different. Um, so at the beginning it's hard and you're talking to walls and you're pushing against those walls. And then soon you got other people pushing with you. You can see the, see the image coming. And then soon there's more and more, and there's organizations, corporations like Ikea, like Walmart, like Cisco, that jump on board and say, yeah, we can do things differently. And then we become the institution. Thank you so much. I, I have so many questions actually around the sustainability and circular economy, but looking at the time, and there's so many all these questions coming in. I think we just have to stop right here, but what a great conversation. Um, so uh, um, I think we're going to open uh, the floor for audience questions. I'm just going from the top. So uh, David Ian, you ask, would you like to unmute and ask um, the question um, about um, looking at the Innovation North website, it looks like you're leading from a business school. Are you suggesting a more ecosystemic view, more than one company or a platform approach? I think you have answered sort of that question. Uh, this question was asked earlier in the conversation, but would you like to address that, Tima or Karen? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's actually a really great question and to address it um, directly is uh, uh, by eco, sorry, I can't see the question in front of me, but I think you said ecosystem approach. And uh, by eco, I just want to make, clear that's industrial systems. So we need organizations collaborate with organizations, not ecosystems as in ecological systems. Okay, so what we need is collaboratives of organizations to really make big change. Circular economy requires collaboration, no question. But if we can figure out, uh, unlock a tool or identify a tool that any single organization can do, any single corporation that's profit oriented, then that's a good step forward. And as part of that process it involves collaboration, the collaborations will then grow over time. So I don't, I'm not sure if I'm being clear here. What we wanna do is get a toolkit that any individual, any corporation can use. And that toolkit will have embedded within it collaborations that would involve a, um, that would involve a whole ecosystem of organizations. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's actually a related question from Dora. It says, how does working in an ecosystem slash network model changes the ways of innovating in business? So uh, how does the ecosystem view or ecosystem model changes uh, um, the way businesses innovate? I mean, businesses have innovated uh, over... Uh, since the Industrial Revolution, since the beginning, so for 300 years. Um, so how does this new perspective lens, the ecosystem view changes uh, the approach? So Dora is a really great question. In fact, I, I think that this is a good part of how we're going to move forward on this issue. And I think, I don't know when it was, maybe it was about 15 years ago. Um, so I started the Network for Business Sustainability. I ran it for 18 years. So I started in 2003, ran it for 18 years. And at some point we had a, also a set of organizations, 15 organizations that got together and I could see that they were really interested in collaboration. That was a piece that they can unlock. Now we've always thought about collaborations as collaborations with uh, buyers, potentially with suppliers, but what really started to shift about a decade ago was that collaborations started to extend not just to the typical partners, but it started to uh, extend to, um, to NGOs. So a lot more corporations want to work with NGOs 
And that is, is something that they just don't know how to do often or with indigenous communities. Often, you know, the, the companies that are working in remote parts of uh, the world or Canada. Uh, they want to work with groups that they've never worked with before or they're wanting to work with competitors. How are they ever going to solve the tragedy of the commons if they don't do it with competitors? And so in Canada's oil sands, for example, uh, we have a collaborative. It's organized by the Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, COSIA, of 10 organizations now, but they started with, I think, 14. Uh, but they're the major players in Canada's oil sands that says that on pre-competitive issues like tailings, ponds, like greenhouse gas emissions, like land issues, that we will share technology, we'll share innovation technology. So we're starting to see collaborations more and more than, and I can show you various other uh, examples in other industries. What, we, what they don't know how to do is how to collaborate, how to get over the IP issues, intellectual property issues. And so uh, that has to be a place in which we play if we really care about systems change. Corporations are still really struggling with how to collaborate. So Dara, has I want to offer, sorry, Joanne, please, please, uh, please, I wanted to ahead. offer one of the questions that I think is uh, kind of gives some really good indicator of kind of the practical experience that we have at Innovation North. And this is a question from Marco. Uh, and it is, are some business sectors more reluctant to systemic change than others? I'm particularly interested in hearing about the banking sector, given their financial leverage influencing multiple systems. Uh, I think probably some of your experience with building Innovation North from the get-go and, and our current partners will give you some a really interesting answer here. It's a really good question too. Yeah, thanks for that, Karen. Uh, so um, now I love the fact that a lot of the audience is uh, from around the world and I do appreciate that. Canada is in a very unique position in our banking sector because we have chartered banks. And so these banks actually control the money, work with the government to, um, uh, to ensure our money supply is, sorry, the, the liquidity within Canada. Let's just leave it at that. So given this tight relationship with some banks and the Canadian government, they all work, they're very risk averse and they all work lockstep. That also creates its own system. The banking sector really cares about the system, the financial system in Canada. So getting banks involved with systems change, it isn't difficult. The difficulty is that, and this is true for all sectors, is how do you get people's time given how completely absorbed they are, let's say with pandemic issues, with new products, with volatility in the markets. And they're saying, ooh, this is big picture thinking. I got a deal with answering my emails today. And so that's to me the bigger issue. Uh, but the financial services sector sees fintech being so disruptive, sees their world changing in such rapid ways. They are very much bought into building greater resilience for their organizations. So it's a double-edged sword. On the one side, the environment's changing so quickly for the fintech sector, sorry, finance sector. And on the other side, they feel and see systems better than most organizations. Thank you, Tima. And here's a related question from Frederick Dukro. Um, if I said your name wrong, I'm sorry. So the question, I'm gonna read it. Um, I have seen numerous examples of companies respecting the spirit of the law, if not the letter of the law, and or asking themselves not to just are we hurting the world? But once it was obvious we can get away with, then what do you do? So, so his question is, what must we include in the toolkit that you talked about to help executives and shareholders find it rewarding to not dish opportunities to grow bigger and more profitable? And mm -hmm. how, how can we protect people who work in organizations whom uh, usually get hurt the most. So when it is clear that we need to dwindle and ultimately stop their business, I think this is a great question, thank you. 
Frederick, you were going to say something. Was that your question? Yes, I was. Uh, I was struggling. Uh, I was uh, trying to make it succinct, and so I did. Uh, I wrote to not dish opportunities, but the whole thing is. People are rewarded handsomely for short-term results at the expense of long-term. And so my, my question is really three questions related. Uh, there is another one later. The first one is how do we make it a non-carrier limiting um, move to make long um, decisions that are good for the long-term but not generating an excess of profit on the moment? The second one is when it is obvious that something is not working, and we have multiple examples, uh, coal mines, um, uh, it could be um, uh, cer certain businesses that create addiction, et cetera. How do we voluntarily modulate down um, these, uh, these businesses? And how do we explore the transition of these people and the protection of these people because nobody would want to shoot themselves in the foot. And finally, the related question is, how do we help people think long-term as a system? And which parties need to do that? Because of course, we're not going to find this in boardrooms. That makes uh, sense, it was not the yeah. purpose. Fantastic questions, Frederick. And you have put your finger on the nub of the problems that we have in businesses and business schools. Okay. I cannot answer them all within the three or four. We only, we go till half past the hour, right? Joanne? Um, yeah. Uh, Jules, can we extend? Uh, there are so many great questions uh, that haven't, we haven't addressed. Can we extend uh, five, 10 more minutes? Jules? Oh, sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's do that. Um, Thank you. The, uh, so the first and third question are very similar. So I'm gonna, and in some ways uh, they are, how do we get people to think long-term when there's so many short-term benefits? Um, and that is, to be honest, Frederick, that's a heart of, the, uh, of my research. I would say that's even the heart of the business problem, right? Uh, is the temporal trade-offs, intertemporal trade-offs. Um, now, I also believe that there's a relationship between long-term thinking and societal thinking. Companies and people that think long-term also tend to be very societally oriented. Um, yet, what's really interesting is if you get companies to think short-term, um, sorry, if you get companies to think long-term, they're willing to do that for their own benefits. So they're willing to make, benef uh, they're willing to make investments for long-term gains, long-term growth. So you get Amazon, and if you look at IP, uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, IPO, sorry, IPO, his first prospectus, um, he said, this is a long-term company. We are going, the only way to beat the competition is to think long-term. So he thought long-term but it was very much for self-interest. And so companies are willing to think long-term if it will get them further ahead. And they've always made those commitments to capital, to people, to any kind of investments if they feel it comes back to them. The disconnect is how do you get them to think long-term for society? That becomes a really difficult play. What we as researchers try to do then is to say, okay, well, if you do good for society, it actually does eventually come back and help you. That link is really hard to make. And, very, and companies are very skeptical because they still have to show their short-term returns. Have I, got, have I answered your question? No, but I do think that there is a way of making the argument. Um, I don't know if you saw the film Ford versus Ferrari. Um, anyway, it's... it's uh, Ken Miles, who's a British race car driver, he's going to uh, race the Ford, a Ford, against a Ferrari. I'm not going to tell you how it ends, but you can probably guess how it ends. But at one point, he and his son come out onto the tarmac of an airport where they've been you know, practicing. And he says to his son, where you see the crack over there, that's when you shift down. 
and the kid, his son, says, well, how do I, how do I, how can you possibly see that crack given that you're going so fast? And Ken Miles, a race car driver, says, when you are really in the zone and you're going that fast, you start to, when you, you start to shift from thinking like this, and you even have these hand motions to thinking like that. What we want to do, what I want to do, is to shift the paradigm so that short term isn't, isn't about this, it's about companies to think about agility, which is about that. And so that means that they expand their field of view so they get more signals in the short term and pick out the signals there that are key. And so that is agility, that's not short-termism. And so if we can build race car drivers that can move fast and know the signals on which they have to shift, that's when we have done what we need to do for business. That's the first and third one. I don't have the answer for you. That's the direction in which we're going. Thank you. you unmuted, Thank you. Frederick. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and yeah, um, there was a second, there was another question, but Joanne, I, I realize that we only have a few minutes left. So do you want to take a different one or do you want me to answer Frederick? Um, um, we're going to extend um, five, 10 minutes. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay. Dr. Tima, yes, that's wonderful. Um, so there, there are so many questions. Uh, um, I think I want to shift uh, the question to this one from Manny. It's really interesting. It's about uh, what uh, business schools teach, and I think that's right uh, in your uh, up your alley. He says, "If uh, Manny, would you like to unmute and ask um, your question about, uh, you know, for the sake of argument, how can we enter into the everyday vocabulary of business schools, and how could we uh, get the businesses and employees to take these radical views?" or ideas seriously and to adapt um, uh, adapt them wisely. Yes, and go ahead. Um, hi everyone. Yeah, you put that photo on in the middle of the street. But, um, yeah, excuse the noise. I'm just going to it. Uh, there's some background so noise. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. I'm out on the street, so you caught me off guard. Um, um, so um, the question, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, so for the sake of argument, if you are able to implement these concepts into business schools and get people to buy into them, all of the students, all of the lecturers, when these graduates go on to work within businesses, how can you get the graduates to be taken seriously? This is new sound ideas uh, that sound a bit wishy-washy by the, uh, the businesses that are employing them and the students that are employing them who will tell you, okay, that stuff's good in theory, but in practice, that's not how it works, which is the, the, the case across the board. Um, so I'm going to repeat back what I thought I heard was, how do you get uh, um, business school graduates who've been, thought with systems, who've been taught with systems thinking to be taken seriously in a corporation that's very reductivist or linear or analytical in orientation. Um, so, so Mani, we uh, don't have a lot of systems thinking courses in business schools, uh, and that needs to change. We have one that we introduced just last year. And I think that the students who go through the systems thinking course actually build amazingly salient skills that will help them in business. And they have a very different way of seeing the problems that or whatever the challenges the opportunities and so because they have a different worldview they actually have more influence within organizations and some of the system skills you all know but are and ones our team is is thinking about uh, but system skills like deep listening becomes really important what do you what does it mean to listen deeply and people who listen deeply do well in our organization another skill that we learned is how do you ask good questions. To be able to hear the system, as Danella would say, to be able to dance with the system, you have to be able to know what questions to ask. To ask good questions then becomes a system skill that changes the way in which um, uh, our graduates would proceed in an organization, 
organization. Another skill is um, not to be able to control people, but to influence people. Influencing skills is really useful within organizations. So at the individual skills level, Monty, I think that a systems approach has a lot to offer and we have to change the paradigm. And I'm gonna really talk out of, out of school, so to say, change the paradigm from leadership, which is what most business schools try to teach, to a paradigm around systems, resilience systems, adaptability systems, agility. And as soon as we change the paradigm, I think that our graduates are, are gonna be really valued. So I don't doubt, actually, I, I, I expect that our graduates who have systems thinking, Karen, uh, a marketing and partnerships person graduated from an MBA program that was about systems leadership, uh, systems influence. Uh, Karen, do you mind if I jump into another question from Dora? And I yes. hear she asks, how can the system for patents and IPRs be reimagined to support systemic innovation or systems approach to businesses? Yeah, yeah, patents, uh, patents are very much about, you know, capitalizing, capturing the value that companies invest in R&D. And so that's why we, we have the system. Uh, and so I think as we move much more to collaborations that uh, I'm not sure that patents are the way to work, but I think that we need governments more than ever before to recognize the investments that companies make, but then also allow for technologies. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I have a really good answer for this, but I feel like open innovation is really the best approach. One of the things that we did with our group of companies was ask them to envision the future. What is that desirable future? And if you have companies across sectors, we have non-competitors at the table. And we gave them five challenges. And we said, if we solve those five challenges, what would the future, that desirable future look like? And these problems were, one was climate change, one was natural resource extraction and lack of natural resources, digital security, pandemic responses, you can get the idea. All of these major corporations ended up with a similar vision of the future. That similar vision was one, open innovation, two, prosperity for all. So there is no doubt in my mind that corporations want to share technologies. They want to create prosperity and they're willing to do that without the uh, intellectual property laws that we have, but it's a hard one to push against. Once again, we have to figure out nudges along the way. That's very uh, helpful. So um, I'm going to ask one more question before we end. So this question would be from... Uh... By the way, Johanny has his hand up if you wanted to Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. Um, Johanny, I just I was monitoring the chat window. I didn't see it. Please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. No problem. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if I um, grasped correctly the, the, the concept here, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so the purpose or the intention now is to um, kind of reorient the business mindset so that business people do not um, necessarily think that the goal of a business is to generate uh, value or like generate profit. monetary, exactly. So profit, so monetary value. Um, yeah, and if that's the case, I was just wondering if actually what may be needed is a kind of rethinking approach in terms of um, sustainability, because ultimately, if we have a business, um, we cannot be financially sustainable if we do not generate profits. So I wonder if uh, instead of like being a bit uh, strict on the term or the concept itself, it would be like, how can we um, kind of inject sustainability or integrate embed sustainability in the services or the offers that business provide? so that it makes a profitable 
products and services? I'll give you a very quick answer to that one, Johanny. It's, it's at the heart of the issues, much like the question on, that um, Frederick had offer, asked about short-termism. The, um, uh, um, uh, just like in your individual life, if you don't make enough money to survive, you in the short term, then you're not going to worry about the long term. And so I think that companies need a minimum amount of profits in order just to keep the lights on. So after they get to that, past that minimum level of profits, then the question is how much is enough? And there's no upper bound. This is part of the problem. And so what we need to do is to make sustainability um, uh, approachable, meaningful, useful for companies. And the reason why I've shifted my language from sustainability to systems is because companies can understand systems. They can talk about digital security. We can talk about uh, congestion in cities. We can talk about things that have meaning. They're systems-based. But sustainability becomes really hard for them to put their hands around. And it all of a sudden just becomes net zero and I'm getting pressure to become net zero. So therefore, what will I do? And it becomes political and polarizing. So the way that we move forward in this conversation, I think, is not to put money up against sustainability, mm. but to recognize that the financial system is deeply entrenched with a lot of other systems. And once we get companies to see systems, I think sustainability will fall into place. Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree with you. If you allow me just one more comment, please. Um, I think uh, for anybody, well, I'm a startup founder and I know what it means when you have to create your budget, when you have your, your yearly plan and you want to you know, increase your revenues and you have to reach out to clients and make a pitch and convince people, right? To, to uh, collaborate with you. So um, if you have a business uh, for whatever scale, I think it is important to keep an eye to the financial part. So and sustainability, I think, should not be the exception, but that's only a personal opinion. So I know that there are many views on that. But the point is that if you're creating a business that, um, yeah, is sustainable, can maintain itself and can provide uh, profits for everybody involved and benefit value, and that includes society, I think we should uh, find a way to uh, visualize it monetarily. I know that is a bit like, it's a scene for many groups in society. And um, please, uh, um, I'm sorry if I am, um, yeah, being like stretching a little bit your level of tolerance in this respect, but um, I do think that sustainability needs to be quantified in some way. And that may be also part, one of the elements of convincing business people in investing in that and making it part of their core uh, values in their business plan. Thank you, Johanny. Uh, we have to end here. Thank you so much, Tim and Karen, uh, for sharing uh, your expertise with us. And thank you for all who tuned in. Um, so uh, have a great day, evening, night, and we hope to see you again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Joss. This has been really wonderful.